Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I am excited for our topic today, and especially our speaker, backed by popular demand. Before I introduce our speaker, I do want to remind you that you are in listen-only mode. All of your lines are muted so that we can really focus our full attention on our speaker today. If you have a question, uh, please take advantage of the chat box that's on the right-hand side of your screen. We're going to save 15 minutes for your questions at the end. So as you have a question, make sure that you write it down so that we're able to uh, take those at the end of our, call, our webinar today. I am excited to welcome back Al Power, Dr. Al Power. He is a friend, colleague, and esteemed author, speaker, uh, geriatrician, and the list goes on and on. I told Al just shortly before we started the webinar that I was going to not do a long introduction because I had taken a look at his slides and I really found that so much of what he was talking about today were things that we all needed to be pushed, challenged, and really stretched to really um, hear what he's got to say. So with that, um, Al did a presentation, a webinar for us back in, I think it was May, and um, this is his second one. And so without further ado, Dr. Al Power, thanks for joining us again. Thank you very much, Susan and Mary, for hosting this, and thanks everybody for joining. We'll probably have a few more logging on as we go, but we're going to get started because, as Susan said, it'd be nice to have some time for some questions. Some of this may be uh, rather stimulating of discussion or questions, and so I want to be sure that we have at least a little bit of time to address that. Um, I uh, recently updated my slide because uh, my friend and colleague, Island Caspi, does wood carvings, and when he saw the ad for the webinar, he uh, showed me a wood carving that he has made uh, in his work in gerontology, and so I thought, well, that's great. Let's put that uh, for our title slide. So I'm hoping everybody can see the slides, and uh, the question is, do we really see the person and not the dementia? Because that is what we always say, but sometimes when we really pick things apart and challenge it, we find that uh, we fall short. Uh, so I guess uh, the first thing I'll say is that this comes with a bit of a trigger warning because this is a um, this is uh, meant to be a somewhat provocative talk today. Uh, there were over 500 people registered. Uh, we've probably got already half of that online, so we're going to have a lot of people on. And as far as I know, you could be anywhere uh, in uh, different types of elder care. You could be anywhere on the culture change journey. And uh, if you know the Greenhouse Project, you know that their uh, hallmark is innovation, challenging traditional models of care and living. And that's why uh, Susan, as she said, loves to be challenged by these talks. And so I bring things to you in that spirit. Um, and uh, I remind people there's no one I've ever challenged more than myself along the way. I've been working in the culture change field in various areas along with my geriatrics uh, for over 20 years now. And so I've seen a lot of changes. And I've come to a place now where I see things very differently than I did 20 years ago. So if you're still back where I was 10 or 20 years ago on that journey, some of this might cause a little whipl whiplash. But I will try to explain all my points here. And uh, what happens is when you uh, when you challenge a way of caring for a group of people, in this case, people with dementia, you have to come up with a model that works for you and you have to come up with a set of guiding principles. And uh, so I've been doing that over the years. And what you often find when you do that, and we see this in any culture change model, is that more and more things appear that we've always accepted that don't fit our new principles anymore. And that's when we have to start to speak up and raise these challenges. So uh, my first slide, let's see if I've got this ready to go. There we go. Uh, this is uh, something that is said so often at conferences that I almost get a little tired of hearing it. If you've seen one person with dementia, you've seen one person with dementia. The idea being that each person is unique and the diagnosis does not change that. Now, I wouldn't be tired of hearing that if it really just sat as it is. But the problem is I've seen people say this many times over and then turn around and say things that indicate to me that maybe they haven't really listened to the quote very carefully themselves. So I just want to remind you that this quote gets thrown around a lot, just like things like culture change and person-centered care get thrown around a lot. But we have to really peel back the onion and see whether we are there or not. 
So I've got eight challenges. I'll try to get to as many of them as I can between now and about quarter to the hour. Um, one of them, the first one is just talking about our overall view of dementia, our types, our stages. I want to talk about dementia-based housing and activity choices. I want to talk about this idea of BPSD, which I mentioned at the last talk when I talked about negotiating risk and choice. Uh, I talk about uh, everywhere I go. If I were going to give a talk about shoe polish, I'd probably throw a few slides on BPSD in there because it's so important. So I'll mention that once again. I'm going to challenge the idea of non-pharmacological interventions, not that we shouldn't uh, avoid drugs, but that we may not go about it the right way. And that's going to lead to the next one, which is four approaches I think we should be avoiding. The next one is the idea of retrogenesis. I'll explain that when we get there. And then if we have time, the last two I have are to really peel apart this idea of capacity for decision making. And lastly, I can talk about how I have come to see these things that we are labeling hallucinations and delusions and why the drugs don't really help for people that appear to have these. So that seems like enough to get us going. And I've already wasted time with the introduction. So let's move on to the next slide, which is really important. And that is, once again, to remind you with all these challenges that this is not at all about saying that anybody is bad people or is not giving good care but to say that there are systems that need to change. And we have systemic barriers, paradigm barriers to well-being, just like we've seen in culture change with institutional care homes. The people that work in institutional nursing homes are really good, caring, talented people. And what we're trying to change is not those good-hearted people, but the system and the mindset and the practices that keep us from doing everything that we really want to do. So with that in mind, we'll jump into the first one, which is our common views of dementia. If you ever book me to speak at your conference, I hope that you don't use this common picture that shows up on just about every conference brochure I go to these days. This shows the person like a tree with the leaves blowing away. To me, this just reflects the common view that the person's disappearing, they're fading away, they're becoming less of who they were, and I don't think that's a very holistic view of dementia. Secondly, um, we see these types of staging diagrams, and they really view a person's life with dementia exactly this way, a steady downward slope. And uh, there are two things that are wrong with the downward slope. Number one, it's not always downward. Sometimes you have days when you're better. Some days, sometimes you have days when things are, or weeks or months when things stabilize. So the idea that people are just declining and declining um, is not really correct. The other thing about this is that this is just measuring certain abilities. Not all abilities decline at a steady rate or even at all, and some abilities may even emerge or become stronger when we live with dementia, such as the ability to be aware of people's body language and be conscious of that, maybe more so than the rest of us are when we're interacting with people. And I see there may be an echo, so Mary has sent a message that if you've got an echo, then turn your computer speakers and try the phone. And I apologize if there are audio issues. So looking once again at these views of dementia, I'm going to move on to this next slide, why I tend to avoid stages and disease stereotypes. I don't mind the kind of stage on the left. I stand on those all the time when I'm either giving a talk or maybe playing my guitar. But we tend to, as the last diagram showed, stage people. This person is stage three, stage four. And um, there are a couple of reasons why I don't like this. But once again, it's a very reductionistic view. It looks at some very basic generic cognitive tests, and it tries to make wholesale conclusions about people based on whether they can spell the word world backwards or tell you what day it is or copy a figure or do things like that. It doesn't tell you very much about the person, and it often will label people inappropriately. So uh, we say that a person at stage four dementia can do these things and cannot do those things. And that often leads us to sell people short or to miss other things the person is capable of doing. And I think I can't think of a better example than a wonderful video that the folks at the Greenhouse Project have been showing. And uh, I got to see it myself a few months ago when I was down visiting. And they showed a woman who's living in a greenhouse who lives with dementia. And she was sitting at a piano. And at the beginning of the video, she's actually asking a person off camera if this is where she lives. So she's confused about the fact that she might even live in this house or not. So you might get an idea of what her ability to do things might be. Uh, as an activity professional, we might say, okay, maybe this person should sit here and sort buttons or something. And maybe they'd find that interesting. But then she turns around and she proceeds to play music by ear, popular songs from her era, 
for the other people living in the home. She is playing them beautifully without music. She is improvising as she goes, making voicings and little fills that she's making up as she goes along. And Susan tells me that she actually sat there for over an hour and took requests from people. So the problem with stages is this woman would be at least stage four, maybe even stage five based on the Alzheimer's staging. You might not expect that she could bring so much meaning and joy to people through her continued uh, excellence in musical performance and understanding music. And so I really think stages cause self-fulfilling prophecies where we expect less of people. So I try to stay away from them. The other thing I'll mention is that if you look at those stages, um, and, and I will confess here to all the people on the call, and uh, we're up to nearly 300 participants, that I actually don't know the seven stages of Alzheimer's. Um, and I'm not dumb. I have just um, I have just forcefully kept myself from learning them because I do believe that they prejudice us as far as what to expect of people. And um, But I did bother to learn the first two stages. The first stage is normal, no symptoms. So everybody who's on this call has stage one Alzheimer's. Uh, the second stage is um, mild forgetting could be age related. So I and many people on this call also have what they would consider stage two Alzheimer's. Now we know that Alzheimer's can be around for years, maybe even decades before you have symptoms. There's nothing wrong with saying that there may be an asymptomatic period, but to start staging people, when they have no signs of illness, to me, is another way of adding stigma and fear to the whole picture. I would never tell you if you had normal weight and appetite and no pain that you had stage one pancreatic cancer. That's kind of what we're doing here. Um, so I, I, I think the system is already biased to make us think differently about people. And the same thing with disease stereotypes. And that's why I put the woman in the apron and the man in the business suit. That seems like a pretty objectionable image, but we do that with dementia all the time. If you have Lewy body, you will act like this. If you have frontotemporal, you will act like this. And never mind that I just uh, didn't care for you very gently. If you're mad at me, you have frontotemporal, so it must be your emotional lability. It's not my problem. And so once again, I think that anytime we try to pigeonhole people or stereotype them, we are seeing the disease and we're not seeing the person. So good. That's number one. Are your echoes all gone? I hope. Here's the big one, segregated living. And I know the Greenhouse Project has pushed back against this quite a bit, but there may be many people on the call who are not there. If you have read my books, you know that I have many arguments against separate living for people living with dementia. And you may have heard me speak about that before. I was in a very small minority when I wrote my first book over a decade ago, but um, I seem to be gaining steam. In spite of that, though, if you look at the aged care sector in the U.S. and abroad, uh, the so-called memory care places are being built at an astonishing rate. So this still seems to be the way that marketing and provider um, planning seems to be going. So let me uh, give you just a few arguments. I could take the whole hour on this, but we'll just mention a couple. And um, so I'm going to start with a quote from a few years ago from the Dementia Friends Project in the UK. They've now spread through the US and around the world. But in order to um, help with what they call dementia friendly initiatives. I prefer the term dementia inclusive because just being friendly to people isn't really including or listening to them, but, but the common term is dementia friendly. And so what Dementia's friends said was by 2015, this was a couple of years before that, we want there to be a million people with the know-how to help people with dementia feel understood and included in their community. So this has been a process to keep people in the community living with dementia and to keep them included understood and uh, assisted as needed. So let me throw this challenge at you then. That is, if a dementia-friendly community is defined as a community that wants to include and positively engage those who live with dementia, then we have to say that the elder care sector, whether long-term care or assisted living, is actually on track to become the most dementia-unfriendly part of our society because we're taking people that our communities are working on engaging and including, and we're putting them in a separate living area. So we're going in the exact opposite to what our worldwide dementia-friendly initiative is trying to do. I will also mention uh, just, you know, it, once again, if you if you are working in, in such places, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. I'm talking about the model of care and whether that's really the best model of care. Um, and I will m mention, uh, in case you're using the term, um, 
that people who live with dementia do not like the term memory care. The people who are out there advocating uh, actually object to it quite strongly. So think about your language there for two reasons. Number one, because they don't believe that dementia is just about memory. There are many other experiences that are changing, but also uh, because they don't like the idea of segregation and they don't like the idea of any living area being named after a deficit or disease instead of honoring the people who live there or perhaps the people who were the benefactors that helped, uh, helped uh, to grow the community. So I think this might be the biggest misconception in elder care. We have, most people say, at least 130. Some people are now saying close to 200 different causes of dementia. These are not related. They're all different things that come from head trauma to Alzheimer's to strokes to Parkinson's. There are many variations. And within each variation, there are many levels of ability. And within that, we have all these people with individual history, strengths, coping skills, individual cultures. And there are over 50 million people of all backgrounds worldwide. So where did we get the idea that there was one type of housing and care approach that would meet such a diverse population's needs? I have to challenge you and ask, is this any different really than saying everybody with blue eyes should live in a certain place? It may seem like it's much different, but if you really look at the person and look at the individuality, you may see that maybe not so different after all. So I'm going to give you a few questions to think about. And these are just to ask yourself silently. You may not answer yes or no to all of them. But I just want you to answer them for yourselves and uh, see where I'm going with this. First of all, if you yourself were diagnosed with dementia, would you want to live the rest of your life in a place that only had other people with dementia living there? Yes or no? The next question is, would you ever want to live in such a place as the home for people with high blood pressure? or God forbid, the home for former aged care administrators. I'll tell you how I'd feel about a home for former doctors, no way. Uh, the home for people of any certain race, religion, ethnicity. Or how about the home for the people who have the same school exam scores? Now, why would I say that? Well, another trend is not only putting people with dementia together, but putting people who have a certain so-called stage of dementia in the same housing. So we have mild stage dementia housing. We have moderate stage dementia housing. And, uh, well, you already know what I think about staging and how that doesn't really uh, see people accurately. But think about this. So the, the cognitive testing we do really doesn't say much about who the person is. They say, you know, do you have certain cognitive skills? It certainly doesn't say, can you play the piano? It doesn't say, uh, do you want to volunteer in your community? It doesn't say, can you give comfort to someone next to you who is who is upset? It doesn't tell you anything about that person. So let's go back to your days in high school um, and think about high school. If anything, high school is probably a better measurement of who you are as a person than the dementia test, because you took English, you took social studies, you took math, science, art, music, industrial arts, business, all different kinds of courses, phys ed. So you are measured in a lot of different areas that relate to your strengths and your personalities. And yet, even there, even with your high school training, would it make any sense to say all the people who had a B-plus average should live in this house? All the people who had a C should live there. Or all the people who had even a B-plus average in English should live here. All the people who had an A average in music should live here. Is it really any different? And if you were in any of these places, would such a place treat you like more or less of a unique individual when it was defined around these generic characteristics? And the other question I want to ask is, do you think having separate living areas makes the other residents and families fear and stigma about dementia greater or less? I think a lot of the reason we do it is because other people complain. They don't want those people living near them. And yet, when you lock people behind the door, you're basically reinforcing that fear. You're telling the other people, you're right. Those people don't belong with you. They're scary. They should be over there. And uh, so it becomes even harder to integrate. And I always tell people that, that integrating people with dementia is kind of like smoking. It's much easier to not start than it is to quit once you're doing it. There have been a couple reviews, the biggest one, the Cochrane Group, which does the biggest, uh, the biggest reviews of medical studies in the world. And they looked at this about six years ago, and they found no randomized controlled trials, obviously. But they also uh, saw 
no evidence of benefit from the other controlled trials either, non-randomized. So their conclusion was that, that there's really no evidence that a special care unit, as they call it, would improve uh, people with dementia, and it's probably more important to implement best practice than provide a care environment. And in this case, they talk about behavioral symptoms, which is a term I'm going to jump on in just a moment. But when you think about that, I have found through much research I've read that people who live in these special areas actually take far more antipsychotics and actually are subjected to far more ver verbal and physical altercations than when they live in mixed living areas. And that's been shown in several research studies. You might argue that since we have all people with dementia there, that might be expected because you don't have people without dementia. So of course the drug use and the number of altercations might be expected to be higher. But then my question would be, so what did you accomplish? You put people in a place where they're more likely to get drugged or hurt by somebody else, either physically or emotionally. Are you really helping that person? The other thing, and, and you know, memory care, it's not only a name that's a little unfortunate, but it means so many different things, and particularly in assisted living, but even in long-term care, there's no standardization. There's nothing that makes you particularly um, qualified. Now, mind you, there are some people that do this that do a very good job of caring for people, but there are others who uh, really don't have any special training beyond what they would have in any other environment. What I've found is that the one constant in almost all places that provide separate housing is the locked door, and I think that's the main driver is to have a place where we don't have to worry about people getting out and getting lost. But a locked door is a locked door. I don't care if you make it look like a bookshelf or if you make it look like a door. In bookshelves, let's face it, can be confusing. You ever try to take a book off of a bookshelf decal and wonder why you can't grab it with your hand? Um, so it's it's not necessarily something that's going to um, <clears throat> going to make people feel happier. Um, it is really a staff-centered solution because we don't have to go over and redirect the person every five minutes if they can't find the door. Uh, and it actually can cause a decreased sense of security for the person and increased distress. One thing that happens, my friend Agnes Houston from Scotland notices this with her Alzheimer's, is that sometimes you get funny tastes and smells. And she smells something that smells like smoke, and she lives at home with her daughter. And one thing that they do every night so that she can rest up and sleep peacefully is they go around, they look at the stove and they look at the lights and everything, and they make sure that everything's turned off and that there's nothing burning so that when she has this funny smell, she can say, okay, I checked everything. I don't have to worry about the house being on fire. Now imagine somebody who lives in your community has that funny smell, wants to smell smoke, and you've disguised their door so they don't even know that there's a door on the place where they are. Do you think that's going to make them feel more comfortable about their ability to avoid an emergency or maybe less comfortable about that? The other big thing about locked doors is they erode our critical thinking skills. If we know a person can't get out or get lost, we stop thinking about why they're trying to leave. We stop looking for those unmet needs that are driving people to the door. And uh, we just are going on with our own tasks and securing the knowledge that they're not going to get out. And, um, and we often don't go any farther than that. It tends to erode individualized approaches. Some people may need some careful planning to make sure they don't get lost. Others may not. But when you're behind that door, pretty much everybody's got it. And the other question is, is this really dementia? How long could any of us last in a place where we could not go outside when we wanted to? I know for me, it would be about two hours. And I would be having all kinds of behaviors, as you might say. The biggest argument for me against segregated living, and the reason I use the word segregation and integration is because I'm a child of the civil rights era, and I've seen this all before. And I have to ask, who else besides convicted felons currently is barred from living around others in aged care besides people living with dementia? We certainly don't bar people by race or religion or sexual orientation. So why are we barring people because of one diagnosis? Um, and in my book, Dementia Beyond Disease, I have a visualization that I like to go through, and I'll just do that very quickly. And to avoid offending anybody, I'm not going to pick on any particular race or religion. I'm going to ask each of you to think about some personal characteristic. You may choose your race, your religion, your sex, your um, whatever. Um, uh, just uh, choose something about you that makes you maybe a little di bit different from other people around you. And I want you to think about that while I read to you the reasons most people give for separating people with dementia. And I want you to apply what I'm saying to your own personal characteristic. 
Others don't like having them in the same living areas. They frighten the other residents and their families complain. We think it's better to move them so that they can live separately. They need different activities, a different living environment, and a different approach to care. They won't bother each other as much as they bother other people. They will be much happier if they are around people of their own kind. Now, I have to say, if I were thinking about my race or my religion or my ethnicity, those statements would be very offensive to me. And yet we make them all the time about people with dementia, and it never occurs to us that they might be also be offensive to somebody who was, uh, just because of whatever reason, uh, diagnosed with a particular family of conditions, not even a condition, but maybe one of over 100 different conditions. Let's go on to the BPSD, and I'll explain that in a moment if you don't recognize the acronym. This is an old Thorazine ad from the 50s or 60s. If you can't read that print, it says, Tyrant in the house, Thorazine can control the agitated, belligerent senile. What a great name for that poor gentleman, huh? And I know this looks horribly dated, but we have to ask ourselves, how much have things really changed since then? Well, we don't call people seniles anymore. We do call them agitated and belligerent all the time. We don't use Thorazine anymore, but we have lots of new drugs that have taken this place, which are equally dangerous in many ways. So let's talk about the so-called behavioral symptoms of dementia. And let me ask you, are we holding people living with dementia to a higher emotional standard than we hold ourselves? You and I might walk, explore, go out and do our steps with our Fitbits, get bored and leave if you're tired of hearing a talk or something. But people in dementia wander, they elope, they're exit seekers. You and I get restless if we're forced into other people's rhythms. People with dementia sundown. You and I get angry, sad, anxious, or frustrated. But people with dementia are exhibiting challenging behaviors. And you and I don't like being locked up, bossed around, or touched by strangers. And guess what? People in with dementia don't like being locked up lost around or touched by strangers. So there is a framework, which if you haven't heard about, you will, because it's been coming from the other side of the world and is spreading through the US and Canada quite rapidly. And it is called BPSD. And BPSD stands for the term behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And now any of these expressions are lumped under this category of behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. This was uh, generated by a group of uh, geropsychiatrists in the late 90s who met in the UK, many Australian and, uh, and English psychiatrists forming the bulk of them. And um, they came up with this frank framework. It's not evidence-based, it has no research to support it, but their meetings were sponsored by Janssen Pharmaceuticals who make the drug Risperdal. And interestingly, if you travel to the UK and Australia, there's only one drug approved for dementia, and that's Risperdal. Now, Risperdal is not safer than any other antipsychotic. In fact, it's dangerous. But once again, the drug that Janssen made is approved in those countries if you document that the person has a BPSD. So you can see the politics behind these things that are supposedly clinical uh, situations. I might mention this is also the case in Canada. So if anyone's listening north of the border, uh, it's you guys too. Now, in the U.S., where the drug is not approved, Janssen has actually paid a $2 billion criminal penalty for illegally marketing this drug to groups that it shouldn't be marketed to. And it is just as dangerous as the other antipsychotics. But because of this language, a bad drug has been approved in many countries around the world. So what's wrong with saying that people's words and actions are symptoms of dementia? Well, first of all, it says their brain disease is causing them to do what they do, to say what they say. It ignores a lot of things. It ignores the relational environment. It ignores the physical environment. It ignores the person's own history and makeup. And it pathologizes those normal things like I just did here on the last slide. It labels things that might be just the same things you and I would do. It uses a bad systems of categorization that really don't have any evidence. And I think it actually has encouraged drug use because let's face it, if you believe that what the person is doing is a symptom of brain disease, of course you're gonna use a pill. How else would you treat a disease? So if anything, I think this has been a barrier to getting rid of antipsychotics and other drugs. It doesn't explain how drug use has been successfully eliminated in many homes around the world. And it tends to misapply a lot of those psychiatric labels too. And I talked about the last one. 
At Schlegel Villages, where I work part-time up in Canada, they've been referring to people's words and actions as personal expressions. I think that's a lot less labeling. It doesn't say that they're difficult or challenging. It doesn't even use the word behavior, which to me has become very much a judgmental term in our use around people living with dementia. Uh, when I have seen people with various words and actions, various personal expressions or signs of distress over the years, uh, I've been able to put the vast majority of them into one of seven categories, one or more of these. And these are the seven I have. The first one, the biggest one, I think, is people often have unmet needs or challenges to various aspects of their well-being, which they're unable to meet by themselves. There are sensory challenges, like I just talked about, changes in the five senses. There may be new communication pathways. I can't tell you the water is cold, so I shout or I strike out because that's the best way I know to give, give you an evidence of my distress. There may be new methods of interpreting or problem solving. So I can't figure out the world because I've got some missing information with my memory being affected. So I put the world together in a way that um, makes sense to me, but doesn't make sense to you. And I get labeled for that. Um, but it's like, uh, well, I'll talk about that when I get to the hallucinations. Um, <clears throat> it could be a response to the physical aspect of the environment, noise, chaos, temperature, et cetera, or relational aspects, the people who are coming in to provide care, the way they're relating to me, whether I know them or not. Um, it may be perfectly normal considering the circumstances as we met mentioned, excuse me. And the last group is what my friend Danielle Greenwood from Australia calls dignity distress. So these are people that are not visibly distressed, but they're doing something that may threaten their dignity or personhood, such as coming out of the room, not wearing any clothes. Now that's not a person who's upset, but their dignity is still at risk. And so that's another category where somebody does something where we need to respond. Now, uh, I think that just about everybody I've seen who's had various expressions who are not acutely medically ill with like a UTI or something. All the other people probably can fit in these uh, categories. And yet there will never be any pill that help any of these things. Obviously, these do not respond to medications. These have other solutions. So I think this gives you an idea of why medications are so ineffective and not just antipsychotics, but really any class of psychiatric drugs. So I always ask people, if someone is saying or doing something that you're trying to understand or respond to, think about how you'd respond if you're told what the journal articles and media tell us, that 90% of people living with dementia will experience a BPSD during their illness. What do you think the cause is? Where do drugs fit into your list of responses? How might you respond differently if instead you were taught that 90% of people living with dementia will find themselves in a situation in which their well-being is not adequately supported? Now. What do you think the problem is? Where do you think the solutions are? Where do you think drugs are as far as helpful choices here? Next one, why non-pharmacological interventions don't work? Many of you have probably heard me tell this story before, but it's such a great story that I have to tell it again. I had trouble with the same thing. I would sit down with the teams because I worked full-time in long-term care for over two decades, and we would uh, talk about people that seemed to be distressed, and we'd come up with a whole list of things to try, and that might work for a short time, but then they'd wear off, and I was back at the med card again trying to figure out what else to give them. And one of the things that really helped me figure out what I was missing was to hear a talk from somebody in eastern Iowa who was working in an assisted living, who mentioned during a conference that a gentleman who had Alzheimer's, had trouble with word finding, moved into their assisted living. And right from day one, whenever he went to the lounge in the back of the building, he kept trying to go out the back door. And the staff would redirect him, they'd give him activities to try, but the more they did that, the more insistent he became. So finally, after a couple of days of just constant struggling with this gentleman, the manager said to them, listen, it's a nice day out today. We have a fence back there. Why don't you just stand back, let him go out the door and just watch him for a few minutes to see if you can figure out what he's trying to do. So they stood back, he went out the door and he walked to the back fence. And just like this photo, the back fence was next to a cow pasture and there was a herd of cows. And he watched the cows for about 15 minutes, turned around, walked inside, and he was perfectly content all day. Well, it got around to his uh, care plan, and they mentioned this to his family, and his family said, well, he was a farmer all his life, and he saw the cows probably, and he always checked on his cows, and he probably was trying to repeat that old pattern. Now, I'm not saying this simply because they came up with a clever solution for this one guy, but to think about in general, what do we do if someone tries to exit a living area? 
We might try aromatherapy. We might try music and memory. We might try a hand massage. We might try folding washcloths. But what if that person wants to check the cows? Is any of those ever going to work? So it's not that it's a bad thing to avoid pills. We do want to stay non-pharmacological if we can, but we can't just come up with a laundry list, including laundry of things for people to do without knowing the individual person. So once again, when we do that, we're seeing the disease, we're seeing a behavior, we're not seeing the person. And you know, music and memory is a wonderful thing, but it's not gonna work for a guy who wants to check on the cows. A person that has no autonomy or has no meaning in their life is not going to find it through a hand massage. We have to make sure that what we do is targeted to the actual needs of the person or else we're not really doing any better than pills and i find we often use these interventions like we use pills you know there's two basic ways we use pills one is standing dose so we might say okay well we're going to give this guy music and memory every day at noon even though that may or may not have anything to do with what his needs are or the other way is prn so we might say well when he gets distressed take him to his room and put on the headphones and he can listen to music and that may calm him but it doesn't solve the problem and the next day at noon and the next day and the next day it's just going to keep happening because we've just kicked the can down the road as it were and that gets to the next one because if we really believe that there's meaning in people's behavior if we really believe that there are unmet needs that are triggering much of this then speaking of kicking the can down the road there are our four common practices that are actually taught in dementia training that I think we have to challenge. And those are reorientation, redirection, distraction, and deception. Once again, if the person has a deep need and all we're doing is telling them what we think is real or distracting or directing them to a different activity or actually trying to tell a white lie, do we ever identify and meet that need that's driving the stress in the first place? We may calm the person for the moment, and I have to admit that once in a while, sometimes we have to do something to help a person who's very distressed in the moment, but we cannot accept that that's the solution or that we've identified or that we're just going to blame this on their dementia. I want you to imagine for a moment that I'm your supervisor and you're coming to me and you've got a serious problem with your job that's bothering you and you need me to help you with that. And you come to me and you explain the, the situation. I sit there and I very sympathetically say, boy, boy, I hear you. That's really tough. That has got to be frustrating. Hey, what'd you think about that World Cup final? Wasn't France great in that game? Now, are you going to ever feel like I cared about you or was really listening to what you were going to say? I have a friend whose sister has some memory loss and she repeats herself a lot and the family tells her, you know, you're repeating yourself and her sister's response is, you're right and I'm going to keep repeating myself until you listen to what I have to say. And I think that's what happens. And I think you've all heard someone say or maybe said yourselves, you know, Mrs. Jones is great when we sit with her, but when we get up and leave, she's distressed again and we can't give her 24-hour care. Well, that's because there's something deeper that we haven't identified yet. And until you do, then she's going to keep calling you back until you find out what that is. That is people with dementia teaching us to go deeper and to be better detectives than we've been up to this point. And it's not always easy, but this is part of the challenge of the work we do. Next challenge, I have a problem with retrogenesis. So what's retrogenesis? It's the idea that people age in reverse when they have dementia, that they go through a seven-year-old stage and a five-year-old stage and a three-year-old stage. Um, it's a, one again, one, once again, one of those very simplistic linear or reverse linear views of people that ignores their history, that ignores their multiple capabilities in different areas. It's true that I may not walk or use a toilet any better than a four-year-old if I'm living with dementia but I'm not a four-year-old. If I have grown up, if I've been educated, if I've worked in a job, if I've been married, if I've been sexually active, if I've raised children, if I've volunteered, if I've suffered loss and grief, I will never ever view the world the way a four-year-old does. And uh, looking at that picture in the lower right, I will never experience bathing by someone I do or not recognize the way a four-year-old does. So just to assume somebody is like a child and they have to be treated that way really is not seeing the person and really is a very uh, 
a very underestimating view of people. And it leads us to do things like use kids' coloring books or put on kids' cartoon shows for people with dementia, thinking that that will be good for them. The bright colors and stimulation will somehow provide some meaning in their lives. It leads to things like robots and dolls. And I know this is a very controversial area. Um, I know a lot of people look very happy when they are kept company. My feeling is that it's a substitute for something that's not there. It may be better than nothing, but it may not be better than other approaches. Uh, if you look at the robot seal studies, they all compare it to an inanimate doll, and they say it's so much better than a doll, but they never compare it to a child or a living thing or or a day that provides more meaningful or caregiving opportunities for elders. So research is often set up to prove a point and often doesn't ask the right questions. And, and I go with Susan uh, Ryan, uh, who's on the call, who I went to for the best explanation of why DAOs can be challenging uh, when I wrote my second book. And that is her idea that people can be very happy and content with a DAO, but maybe the biggest danger is not how they're feeling at that moment, but how it causes us to see them. If we see the person as childlike, then we start to underestimate their capabilities, their potential for growth, their potential to make decisions or negotiate risk, and to engage in other things that might give their life meaning. So that's the potential danger. And I just ask you to be very careful of those practices. Two more quick ones. I think we might make it. We'll see. <clears throat> Decision-making capacity. As a doctor, I do lots of advanced directives with people. And I talk about whether people seem to understand the components of advanced directives. We don't talk about competence in the U.S. Competence is a legal term which has to do with a lot of financial transactions and is usually determined by a court. What doctors determine here is what we call capacity, which is the ability to make certain decisions. So when it comes to advanced directions, I'm determining the capacity of the person to understand and make consistent decisions about what they would want in the way of medical care in case of illness or emergencies. And I try as best I can to make those determinations. But that is only one set of decisions around fairly complex medical situations or maybe around things like paying bills or disposal of property. Those are real and they're very much affected by dementia. But I think what we tend to forget is that just because you lose those capacities, there is a multitude of day-by-day, moment-by-moment decisions that you have the perfect right and ability to make. So what happens is a person can't sign their advance directive, they can't pay their bills, and we start telling them when to get up. We start telling them what kind of activities to do. We start telling them when they should have a bath, or we don't listen to them when they say they don't want something. Uh, we stop giving people the ability to make decisions about everything. So I think we should use the disability model, which is that for any given decision, we always assume the person's able to make that decision until they prove otherwise. And even if they can't make it by themselves, don't forget that the most powerful thing you can do to help people with dementia is what we call supported decision making. Not taking over for the person, but aiding them giving them the information they need or the parameters they need to help make more uh, more to help make more decisions that are in their best interest and that fulfill their needs and preferences. Um, so once again, don't let the big thing of she doesn't have capacity stop you. If someone is uh, saying no when you're taking their clothes off, no means no. It doesn't matter what their ability to make other decisions is, you have to stop. If I came up to you on the street and tried to move your clothes and you said no and I didn't listen, I would be arrested. It is no less of an assault to do those things to people who live with dementia in long-term care. When you change address, as Danielle Greenwood says, you do not give up your human rights. And so we have to really push ourselves to not jump to wholesale decisions. And a lot of this, let's face it, comes from family members. You'll have somebody walk in saying, I'm the POA or I'm the healthcare proxy. I'll decide when she gets up. I think she should do this. I think she should do that. And one area that both the U.S. and Canada have fallen down in a lot is the social worker or nurse manager calling a family member and saying, okay, we need to set up your mom's care plan. What's a good day for you to come in? Without going to her mom and saying, who would you like at your care plan? Would you like your daughter to attend? The assumption that we are going to invite people without asking the person whose care plan it is who they want in the room. Once again, it's just one of those things. It's probably not consequential in most cases, but it shows that we are ignoring the person and not giving them that choice and control that they need. 
Lastly, I'll do this two second version of this. We can make a whole talk out of it if you want. Um, I've come up with a way of looking at what we call delusions and hallucinations that um, some people uh, have liked in our teaching. And I wrote about it in uh, one of my books, I think the second edition of my first book. And I went to our favorite game show here, Wheel of Fortune. And I thought about what is it like if you're trying to understand the world when you don't have all the information? And when I say don't have all the information, I mean, we have memory problems when we live with dementia. We can't, the, the information may be there. We don't necessarily lose those memories, but we can't always access them when we need to. So when you wake up and you're trying to figure out where you are, who these people are coming in your room, you take what you can remember and you don't have what you can't remember and you do your best guess at what's going on. And let's face it, when you don't have all the information, you don't always get it the way uh, the rest of us do. You may miss the boat here and there. It may make perfect sense to you. Your brain isn't dead. You are working very actively trying to figure out the world, but you're doing it with a limited board. Uh, like in Wheel of Fortune, when you only have a couple letters and you're trying to solve the puzzle. So imagine uh, you're, you've got an object and you've got three letters and the, the first letter starts with an S and the middle word is of, something of something, and the last word starts with L and ends with a Y. Now, um, if we're relaxed and at home, we might look at that and say, well, I'll bet that's Statue of Liberty. And that's great. But if you're on the show and the TV's at, staring at you and you got money on the line and Pat Sajak's only giving you 10 seconds and you're nervous and you don't have that information, you might go in a different direction. You might say, is it stacks of laundry or is it states of lunacy or something crazy like that? Now, and for those of us who know it's Statue of Liberty, that may seem wrong or just silly. But for the person in that position, they're just trying to fill it in the best they can. The reason I say it is because I think this is what's going on with dementia. This is not a delusion in the sense of a person with psychosis. A delusion is from too much dopamine activity in the brain, and that's what makes a person with schizophrenia think that their brain is being controlled by an evil computer from Washington that's making them go out and hurt people. And the solution to that is to lower your dopamine levels by using a blocking drug, and that's what antipsychotic drugs are. But there is no type of dementia that increases your dopamine. Most of them decrease it. So when you are just misinterpreting the world because of missing information, these drugs don't help. An antipsychotic is not going to help a person on the wheel of fortune to solve the puzzle. Now, what about the visions people see with Lewy body dementia? Well, that's due to damage to the visual center of the brain. It's damaged nerves firing off random signals. Once again, not going to respond to antipsychotics. In fact, they're particularly dangerous in that form of dementia. But this is one group that does occasionally have too, dope, too much dopamine. And the reason they do is because we give it to them. People with Lewy body dementia tend to be stiff. They are like a person with Parkinson's. And so we tend to give them Parkinson drugs, which are basically dopamine. The thing is, when you have Lewy body dementia, the Parkinson drugs don't work very well. And there's a very narrow margin between some benefit and a lot of toxicity. So if a person with Lewy body dementia is having disturbing visions, the first thing I would do is cut down the Parkinson drug they're getting because there's a good chance that's causing it. There's nothing we give people that is more hallucinogenic uh, among prescription drugs than Parkinson medications. So keep that in mind as well. And so in conclusion, uh, as we have said, and as I put in the way I, um, the way I organize the Eden domains of well-being in my pyramid, the foundations for well-being are the deep knowing and the relationships. Everything else flows from them. And unless we know the person, knowing everything we need to know about dementia doesn't really solve those dilemmas. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I just threw at you pretty quickly. Um, but uh, we still have some time left. And so I appreciate your time and attention. And I'm going to turn it back over to Mary and Susan, who can look through the chat box and maybe moderate some discussion. Thanks again, everybody. Oh, thank you, Dr. Power. This was fabulous, uh, really provocative. We've have already had some great uh, questions and comments in the box. So I'm going to start reading them. And I would encourage, if you are sitting with a question, please put it into the uh, chat box, the question box, and I will get those read to Dr. Power. We'll take your questions up to the top of the hour. So here's the first question. What do you think about separating residents because they have sexual interest in each other? In Ontario, we have a gray area between the Resident Bill of Rights in long-term care and what the Ministry of Health calls a lack of capacity to consent to sexual relationships. 
not even the act of maybe kissing or touching? That is a great question, and it's not just in Canada where it happens. And once again, culture change is not just for providers. Culture change is for regulators, is for family members, for doctors, for lawyers, you name it. Um, this is a really tricky area. Once again, your human rights are not gone when you change address. And a diagnosis of dementia does not take the right that you have to engage in friendships or relationships with people of your choosing. People do this all the time and we don't question it until this word dementia comes in. I think that what we need to do is we need to watch out for actual harm and or potential for actual harm. And that can be a bit subjective, but I think that is really our guidestone. Unfortunately, many things override that. People's own biases and opinions and stigmas override that. Sometimes a family member uh, really can't tolerate seeing their father holding hands with a woman who's not uh, their mother. Uh, whether she's deceased or not. Um, sometimes uh, some of the workers uh, don't like to see or uh, don't like to think of people engaging in these things. I will say, and, and there's discussions about this in both my books, it's a big area, but there are, and both books uh, uh, approach different areas around sexuality, but there are many, many things people are expressing that have nothing to do with sexual intercourse. Some of it is just companionship, some of it is just human touch, which people don't get enough of, or they don't get touched with intention. We tend to be very clinical in bathing them and dressing them, but we don't actually, we don't actually show affection often. Um, sometimes people are just confused you know they know that uh, they don't they don't usually spend their day in their bedroom so when it's bedtime they figure they have to go sleep somewhere else and they may climb into another bed they may be used to having that person lying next to them there may be no interest in sex but they're just used to to uh, bumping up against somebody else when they go to sleep at night um, there are many many things and then and then sexual activity is another thing too um, I think that every home and there's some great talks about this out there that I wish I could encapsulate but I think every home needs to set up a policy around rights and responsibilities with um, expression of sexuality and intimacy. One great home that's done that is the Hebrew home in Riverdale in the Bronx, New York. And you can Google and see their policy. They have both a policy that affirms people's right to engage in relationships, intimate and otherwise, to um, have um, access to privacy, to have access to sexually explicit media, as long as it's legal to do it, and basically things that are that are not legal or not illegal or dangerous. Um, in Australia, I know of one community where they've actually, where they have legal brothels, where they've actually taken the gentleman to a brothel um, who wants to have sexual relations that can't anymore with uh, because he's not married. Um, so that, that expresses people's right. But the other thing the Hebrew home has is they have an assessment sheet. And it doesn't, you don't have to have a certain level of capacity. You need to be able to talk about these things. You need to watch how the person reacts when the person's around, when they're sitting with the person, when they're holding hands, if the person puts their hand on their leg, what is the reaction? If you see a positive reaction, that suggests that this is something that the person is happy with. If you see a negative reaction, that suggests that's a problem. Unfortunately, we see a lot of people who are separated simply because they held hands at the dining room table or somebody made a comment about how somebody else was attractive and they got ripped apart. And I think that's kind of a cruel thing to do. Um, we do not lose our desire for intimacy and intimacy is much more than sex, but we don't, just, we don't lose our desire for physical or emotional intimacy just because we are old or because we live with dementia. Awesome. All right, here's another one. In regards to including persons with more advanced dementia in a quality of life survey, we often hear either it's too difficult for them, their answers can't be depended upon. How do you respond to this mindset? And are there particular tools you have found to make something like a quality of life survey more accessible to residents with dementia? I, I haven't got a tool at the top of my head that I can point to that you should get this and use it, but I do think that they bring up some important points. And I think that we have to be careful about the questions we ask and how we quest, how we how we ask them and how people answer them. One thing we did with the Eden Alternative Wellbeing Tool to make it more useful for people living with dementia was to change it from a five-point Likert scale to a three-point. So instead of saying somewhat agree and agree, which can be challenging for some people, we just say yes, no, or I can't decide. So a person can say yes, a person can say no, or they can say, I don't know. And then you can, it's much easier to score something like that. It's a little bit less scientific, but it gives you an idea. 
Once again, we also want to use all of our best communication techniques, rephrasing words, talking to people about things. And sometimes, you know, even questions are difficult because a question requires an answer and an answer can be right or wrong. So I often tell people in helping people with communication challenges to speak like a sports interviewer. Don't ask questions, just make statements like they do, you know, when they stick the microphone out and say, boy, that was quite a home run you hit out there. You know, it's not a question, but then they stick the mic in your face and expect a response. And often I find if instead of asking information, if you say something, the person will often fill it in and uh, that way they can set the parameters about whether they're right or wrong. So if you get to the point where you've rephrased questions, you've made them simple, you're still having trouble, sometimes you can just talk about a subject and you can hear the person express an opinion about the subject that will give you a really good idea about whether that's something they like or they don't. Um, sometimes with advanced directives, when you say, well, I knew a person who had a heart attack and now they've got her on a ventilator, but if she's having trouble getting off it, the person might say, boy, that's terrible. I wouldn't want to live like that. And there you go. Maybe they can't sign the form, but you've gotten some direction from them. So I, I think we have to be we have to be very uh, clever with those things. The other thing I'll mention, we are working at Schlegel Villages to do what we call dedicated support. Uh, pretty common in, in greenhouse homes, but uh, not universally and outside very uncommon. And that is having the same team members care for the same residents all the time, not rotating around even, even once every six months, not rotating, but having the same people. And so one of the things we're doing, it's a multi-stage process and we're doing a research study too that we hope to publish, working with Dan Greenwood from Australia. But one of the things that she's recommended is that we start when we get the team selected by lining up preferences for who will work with whom. Because we all know that some people have preferences and both, uh, both the team members are asked, who are the elders that you would like most to care for? Is there anyone you find difficult to care for? But we also ask the elders, who are the people you would like caring for you and who are the people you do not want caring for you? Now, once again, people with dementia often can't remember names, but what we do in this process is we will take a photograph of each of the of the team members and we'll take them in and we'll point to them and we'll say, what do you think about this person? What do you think about that person? And often that facial recognition and the person's response or facial expression will tell you exactly what you need to know. So I think if we really work at it, it may not be a, a survey because the surveys have to be asked a certain way and they just may not work. But if you want to know somebody's opinion about something, there are many ways to solve the puzzle, I think. Great. So what kinds of things are being done to convince the medical profession to stop using stigmatizing jargon, such as behaviors, such as BPSD, with regard to cognitive change? Well, that's a good question. I'll tell you, we're calling people out more and more. We've been writing letters to the media when they use words like demented or dementia sufferers. We've been writing to journal articles about that. Um, well, I was a, a keynote at Alzheimer's Disease International in 2015, and we've set up language guidelines since then. People still don't always follow them, but we, when we ask for proposals, we send out guidelines saying, these are words we don't want to see you use in your proposals. This is how we want, and we explain why. There are groups like Dementia Action Alliance or Alzheimer's Australia. Australia, other groups that have language guidelines that people can use. So we're, we're slowly uh, trying to get there, but it's really tough. The BPSD thing, I was with a group uh, about four or five years ago of six people that tried to get a couple of presentations at Alzheimer's Disease International and never got accepted. And, and we were just all so busy that we never got much of a groundswell going, but a few of us have gotten together again with some new people. So myself, uh, two dementia advocates, Kate Swaffer uh, is, is a big one, uh, Christine Bryden in Australia, uh, Dan Greenwood, but also Susan McCauley, who's a family former family member, advocate from Montreal, Liz Lester, uh, from from UK and uh, Leah Bassani uh, and Sonia Barsness. Leah is from Melbourne and Sonia Barsness is from right in the DC area. And we've been, we started another uh, hashtag ban BPSD group and you may see our tweets on Twitter. And uh, we've made up a brochure with our statement and copies of some of our publications. Um, and Kate's gonna circulate the very first version of that at Alzheimer's Disease International in a week actually this week, next week, whenever it is. Uh, yeah, I guess it's probably this week uh, in Chicago. And we, are, and we have an article in the Australian Journal of Dementia Care about it. And so we're going to start really trying to push and uh, get this out there. And as I said, I talk about it everywhere I go, whether, I, whether it's appropriate to the topic or not. I just think that you can't say enough about this because it really does, it is, I believe, a harmful construct when it comes to better care for people. So I'm going to try to get two more questions in. I'm going to read okay. both of them to okay. save a little bit of time. 
Great. Um, in regard to touching, dressing, bathing people, how do you address the issue that people need to be changed and clean and they may not have a choice about wanting to do it another time? That's the first. Let me get to the second one and then I'm going to um, we're going to have to conclude after that. Um, second question, could we come out with a different word instead of dementia? It still carries oh, stigma. What yeah. do you think about <laughs> Naomi Bell's phrasing disoriented old people? So I'll let you respond to those two. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, those are great. All the questions have been really great, and I appreciate these really deep deep and uh, thoughtful questions. Um, first one is um, the person always needs to have a choice to do something another time. If they don't, then it, it is an infringement of their human rights. And it really is tantamount to abuse uh, to do that. I understand the issues with skin breakdown. I understand the issues with cleanliness. I understand this is a big clinical concern. We don't want people to get infected or have pressure sores or those types of things. But if the person is uh, saying no when we're trying to do something, then we haven't figured out yet what will help them say yes. And a lot of it comes right down to our basic communication. Are we going in? Are we sitting down? Are we checking in with the person for a minute or two, finding out how they are, reestablishing our relationship with them, explaining what we want to do, bringing them into it, saying, how would it be if we do this? Or maybe rephrasing instead of, I'm taking you to the bathroom. What do you say we go powder our noses, get you ready for the day? Whatever may help the person to frame things in more positive light. It just means we have to go back to the drawing board and we have to keep doing it. When you know that there are 150 to 160 homes in the U.S. that are using zero antipsychotics, you know that the solutions are out there. But we just have to work harder sometimes. And uh, once again, I'm going to quote Daniela once again. She said, I can't tell you the solution to every resident who's having difficulty with this or that task. But I can tell you that if you do something to someone who says no, that's abuse and you can't do that. And um, and I think that's quite clear because once again, uh, if you do that, even if you think that we have a right to do it, when you do that, you are creating a, an indelible emotional memory that you are attacking that person. Now, you may not feel that way, but that's the way the person feels and that's all that counts. Because with dementia, you lose facts pretty readily, but emotional memories are very enduring, even with advanced dementia. And so if you have a bad interaction, that's going to hang around. And if you bring in three people, or as I heard about, God forbid, the other day, four people holding someone down to give them a shot of hell doll, then uh, you are creating a hell on earth for you every other time you go in that room. So you've just got to get together. And um, I have a well-being approach in my book, Dementia Beyond Disease, and it works when nothing else works. And so I recommend you to chapter 10 of that book. That's my one commercial. Now, dementia, two seconds on dementia. I don't have a better word. I agree with you 100%. Dementia comes from an old word that means out of your mind, dementia. It means insane. It is very stigmatized. Um, uh, and I don't have a better term. I certainly don't like the new DSM terms of minor and major neurocognitive uh, disorders. I don't think that's better. Um, I'm not crazy about disoriented old person because once again, it's more about, it's not just orientation. Uh, Kate Swaffer doesn't have any trouble with orientation, but she has trouble with certain aspects of language and reading and other things with her frontotemporal dementia and primary progressive aphasia. And it's not just old people. Kate will be the first one to tell you, I got my dementia at age 49. I'm not, I was not a disoriented old person. Um, so I don't think that does it. My friend Nader Shabahangi, who's about as um, uh, Zen pushing the envelope about dementia, he's someone I go to for, for my own learning uh, at least once a year. He uses the word forgetfulness. And once again, people with dementia will complain that, that it's more than just memory loss. His, his feeling is, well, it's more than just forgetting facts. It's about certain consensus uh, behaviors and activities too. I just like it because it's a general term that doesn't label people and stigmatize them. Um, but once again, I agree that that still doesn't quite capture it for me. Um, I've used the word dementia because I don't think it's as horrible as other things. And I feel like I still need something that, that people recognize. But I agree with the person who asked the question. Uh, I, I don't think it's a great word. And I have yet to come up with a better one. So keep those cards and letters coming. Maybe we'll find one one of these days. What I say nowadays is people with changing cognitive abilities. So I use the different ability or disability approach and say I have changing cognitive abilities. It's less stigmatizing. Um, that's the best I can do, but it doesn't work in every sentence, unfortunately. Al, you have once again, as somebody put in the, the chat box, 
Giving us a drink from a fire hose. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was afraid that might happen. Well, you know, I like to yeah. get their money's worth. And with a free webinar, you, you can't help but get your money's worth, I suppose. But <laughs> Exactly. Well, you have certainly stimulated a lot of our thinking. You have challenged us to think a bit differently and, um, and to do a better job with those that uh, we have within our charge. So thank you for that. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. You it's will a receive pleasure. a... Yes, thank you. You will receive a link to the webinar as well as a PDF of Al's PowerPoint slides. So thank you for joining, and I'm quite sure that Al will be back. So stay tuned, <laughs> and uh, we've got your email addresses now to keep you posted. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you again, everyone. Al. Take care. You're quite welcome. Bye-bye.